Hi everybody, I'm Lawrence and I'm going to share a brief presentation I've prepared to give you some insight as to what it's been like working with Citizen South East from the perspective of a volunteer. So who am I? I've been volunteering with Citizen for the last year and a half on a handful of sites. I've studied social anthropology and I've always been a keen archaeology enthusiast. For me, Citizen was a golden opportunity to widen my skills and archaeological experience in an informal setting. Also, though, I think once I grasped the urgency of erosion, I felt a personal responsibility to try to help to record as much as possible before it disappeared out of the mud. Um, I've chosen two sites to talk about I've worked on, both on Mersey Island, uh, Cooper's Beach in the east and the Monkey Steps to the west of the island. First, I'll introduce the sites themselves and the features present before going into my involvement and in the instance of the Monkey Steps, also some personal research I did. So, um, so the first site I want to talk about, Cooper's Beach, as you can see now, it's a large intertidal site. It's located on the eastern end of Mersey Island in, oh, laser, in this area here. Um, it has a rich archaeological array of features spanning thousands of years. Um, so just to give you some idea of the sort of features we've been dealing with, um, we've had Saxon fish traps. Um, you should be able to see, can you make out a V there? Um, so that's a V of stakes. These formed an intertidal funnel by which fish were procured in the mid to late Saxon times. Uh, we know from other sites that, um, that Mersey became a wealthy area at this time and it's possible that fishing could have helped to generate some of this wealth. Um, on the other side of Estuary at Bradwell there's a place called Collins Creek, I think in which fish trapping was so prolific, their remains spread up to one and a half kilometres into the mud. Uh, we've also got stakes, which we think are probably Roman, um, in a line. Uh, we th I think they, we've deduced they're probably Roman due to their uniform arrangement and also the, fact, also the way they've been cut. Um, part of a Roman mortarium for pouring oil was found nearby as well, um, but the significance of this remains unknown. Uh, moving back through time, we've got an Iron Age burial site, uh, found by Mark and Jane Dixon <coughs> in a fetal position. It was radiocarbon dated to between 400 and 380 BC. Um, Oysterman working in the area also found an Iron Age skull dating from 350 to 320 BC, which could be suggestive of further burials. And I think I've got a picture of the former skull as it was coming out of the mud in situ. Very Halloween y. <laughs> um, going back through time, we've got. Um, excited, very excitingly, a Bronze Age trackway, which I think is unique. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'm right in saying it's one, only one of, the only one of its scale ever found in the Thames Estuary area. Uh, the remaining parts of it appear to indicate it was at least 50 metres long by 2 metres wide, and it was probably built for traversing boggy ground between drier hillocks and a very different landscape to what's there now. It was originally found by Bubby French, who's an oysterman, you can see on the right. Um, and as if this isn't enough to deal with on one beach, we've also got ancient landscapes. Um, we've been encountering evidence of fauna include, and uh, flora, including an oak forest, bison remains, and even a mammoth tusk, which you can see is, has been done with one of those three-dimensional drone images there. Uh, and it's all disappearing out of the mud and into the sea. So my participation personally over several visits um, has included surveying the site, uh, for this, we had a number of methods, the first being walking the site, photographing and using the app to record features. Also, we GPS features accurately to within a centimetre with the GPS pole and used that information to log and plot the site. Uh, we also helped Jim, uh, another volunteer who was using a drone to photograph the site on predetermined flight paths and from which he was able to construct amazingly accurate three-dimensional plans. <coughs> Um, another important aspect of surveying the site was returning regularly to record newly exposed features and monitor the effects of erosion on what we had already documented. Um, as well as surveying the site, we helped examine some features. Um, this included cleaning features carefully with brushes for on-site identification by specialists and preparing, retrieving and transporting targeted samples for analysis. Uh, and in particular, you can see this applied to um, a beam from the Bronze Age trackway over there. Uh, we were then invited to Mola, where they were further examined uh, very kindly. And here we continued to clean the causeway beams in the specialist environment to identify bark and sapwood for dendrochronological chron dating, as well as to analyse the tool marks with the expert who came, uh, Damien. Um, he suggested a date of late Bronze Age based on the size and shape of the marks. You can see there he's using that axe to make a comparison that axe head. 
Uh, and we, we even did some scale drawing of the beams with Damien as well. Um, and then finally at Cooper's, I just wanted to mention um, developing knowledge of site context. Uh, I volunteered myself to help Mary from Mola in profiling the geoarchaeology of the site through auger drilling. Uh, here we drove a bore into carefully chosen points around the site, recorded and bagged the samples which were sent off to specialists, I think who were based at the Natural History Museum, in order to understand better the landscape the trackway would have been built in. And aside from this, we had a jolly good time. We had a barbecue, a tour of, a, a tour of the church, we got, and we got covered in mud. I'll just leave you to ponder that image for a minute. And then moving on. <laughs> um, so now the other site on West Mersey, the Monkey Steps. Um, we have a smaller area that you can see here. It's more easily accessible and with a very different archaeological content being exposed. Um, features... Oh, there you can see it there on the west of the island. Um, features present include uh, what we believe is most probably some sort of Roman jetty, a collection of mysterious pits, um, which you can see there, uh, lots of unidentified stakes, and dense dis distributions of pottery. Uh, this pottery includes Roman Samian ware, grey ware, BB2 black burnished ware, hypercourse tiles, and even some medieval 13th century pot pottery which was found. Um, features, ne and features nearby, um, which might be relevant, include a continuation of similar pits spreading eastwards along the beach, and some of which appear to have been used as Victorian rubbish dumps. Um, a Roman villa on the hill which you can no longer see, but which the, remain the remains of which you can see in St Peter's Church, which I think were recycled in this tower, originally a, a Saxon fortification partly. And... Um, yeah, so that's, that's the features nearby. Um, my participation on this site, which is then included, firstly, reinforcing many of the previous skills and experiences from Cooper's Beach. So that would include GPSing, monitoring erosion, recording features, helping Jim with drone targets, but also in other capacities, such as field walking the site. Uh, here we marked pottery as we carefully walked the site as a group, so they could be GPSed and some removed as samples. Uh, we also did more archaeological drawing, but this time from a baseline, so on-site and within a context. Um, and I personally did a greater level of research, triggered partly by finding two nice black burnished ware pots on site and wanting to learn more about them and their presence there. You can see one of them, I found that one. I don't think, I'm not sure if you found that one though. Um, so, yeah, just to talk a little bit about the research I did quickly. Um, in pursuing research regarding my pots, it soon became clear that they were BB2 black burnish ware. In other words, relatively inexpensive local wheel thrown pottery from the Thames estuary area and manufactured between AD 140 and 3rd century, uh, as opposed to BB1 black burnish ware, which I think comes from Dorset, is hand thrown, coarser and slightly later in date. Um, following this and in further identifying my pottery and other shards occurring on our site, I discovered very similar pieces of pot in similar concentrations recorded at a site called Stamford Wharf between Tilbury and Canvey Island. Now, interestingly, although the pottery was manufactured very close at a kiln in Mucking, Stamford Wharf is actually a salt production site, and not only the high concentrations of pottery, but even nearby manufacturing, the nearby manufacturing of black burnish ware can be in part attributed to salt production. So, um, yeah, I discovered pots like the ones we were finding are so closely related to salt, salt production that sometimes the two manufacturing processes would actually share halves on the same sites. Um, I started to look at Stamford Wharf further and found the following features were present there and are often are, are found on similar sites uh, around the transition zone, that is, where the tide comes at high tide. Often on marshland environments, like the ones we've been dealing with, and commonly in the Thames Estuary, Kent and Essex. Um, yeah, so the fe some of the features that you would commonly find would be a series of settling tanks or evaporation basins, often fanning out from a central half, which could, could possibly resemble our pits, maybe, is what, what I was thinking. Um, paths for crossing marshy ground. And interestingly, we, re we recently discovered an oyster shell path running alongside our pits, similar, similarly to how this one is, is located. Um, jetties for transporting produce and necessary materials, which we, we, we know we have a jetty. Um, high distributions of black burnish ware, which again we've had, and ditches for catching water at high tide. I don't know if we've seen anything that resemble them. Um, also, uh, sometimes they incorporate boat houses, and we recently discovered la a large square building-like feature running alongside the eastern edge of the pits. So yes, the, 
the plot thickens. Um, you often find bricotage or crude fired clay walls for lining evaporation basins. Um, although we haven't necessarily come across these specifically, there is a lot of unidentified, un unidentified clay-like chunks on the site, and what's more, Roman roof and hypercourse tiles were often recycled for the purpose of lining basins. Um, as we've already mentioned, these have been found on the beach, so that could be a possible explanation. And on top of all this, it was very common for villas to have estates as part of their, of their function, small estates, uh, in which small-scale industries took place for the purposes of trade. Uh, and in Kent, there are sites in which this has been seen to include salt production. Um, these villa estate salt production sites, which started to, to decline in the 3rd and 4th centuries with the rise of more complex and intensive salt manufacturing, um, yeah, so they, they started to decline with the rise of more complex sites like Stanford Wharf in the 3rd and 4th centuries, is basically what I was getting at. Um, and then, just briefly, um, enriching the picture is the fact that Mersey is known for a number of red hills which denote late Iron Age salt production and are associated with a kind of pottery called Belgic ware. Uh, the majority of the examples of Belgic ware in the museum were actually found at the Monkey Steps. Um, so could this suggest continuity as well? Uh, we already know that so-called Romano-British cultural diffusion took place on Mersey on account of a unique barrow. Um, even though barrows weren't to Roman custom, the burial is contained within a gl Roman glass bowl in a Roman lead casket and adorned with spices found in out the outer reaches of the Roman Empire. Uh, finally, just briefly, we also know that salt was a very important trading commodity in, commodity in the Roman conquest of Britain at this time, to the extent that soldiers were even paid in bags of it sometimes. Um, Mersey would have been situated in the centre of an extensive and busy coastal trade network between villas, production sites, forts and military camps, other Roman ports and settlements. Coastal trade certainly would have been more efficient and cheaper in this mar marshy part of the country. So, in summary, I'll just quickly read this out. I know that's not your average slide. <laughs> um, could the monkey steps be painting a picture of typical late Romano-British villa estate of a late Romano-British villa estate with a small-scale production industry and serving jetty? Here they could have been importing and exporting commodities such as salt, pottery and shellfish in vessels now submerged in the mud. If so, this would have taken place in a network of Roman coastal trade between manufacturing sites, military camps, towns, villas, and with the estuaries making for shorter and more efficient trading routes between sites than was offered by land. If so, is it also possible the site was an extension of earlier Iron Age practices? And finally, is it possible the site went out of use with the rise of larger non-villa estate-based production centres such as Stamford Wharf in the 3rd and 4th centuries, as was the case in the Kentish villa estates? Yes, so that's my research that I've been doing, basically. Um, just to finish then and look to the future, what comes next with Citizen? Uh, personally, I hope to further my personal research on, on this area and hope to involve myself as much as possible in the Citizen activities that will take place. I hope to continue to develop a catalogue of archaeological skills and help in the monumental task of trying to record as much archaeology as possible before it's destroyed by the sea. And it only remains to say thank you, Citizen.